God has a heart on Perfect world, no dream. Primitive He's a traitor. He's a traitor. You're all going to die down here. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Namaste, my beloved true seekers. You are entering coffee, cigarettes, and gnosis. A district of the virtual Alexandria broadcast through the always unstable freethoughtmedia.com. This is where we don't take prisoners, but liberate them from the counterfeit reality that was imposed on us by the angelic mafia and the mechanism of society that made us all into clones, sheep to be fed into the slaughterhouse of death and rebirth until our souls are extinguished to the point of no return. I was going to the worst place in the world and I didn't even know it yet. And how did this all happen? Well. We sold our comfort and safety instead of individuality and freedom. We mortgage our heavenly right for a rotting body. We access our creative attribute without accessing the rest of our potentialhood. Sophia, the wisdom of God and the world's soul, fell and we fell with her through the paradises of less and less perfection until we were suffocated by nightmares and laziness and forgetfulness, as C.G. Jung said. We can never see past the choices we don't understand. But what are you going to do? I'm sure you know I'll say Gnosis by now. (laughs) I am and I am Abraxas, the god above god, the seal the master templar used to protect their treasures, the origin of the word abracadabra, and recently why so many people think I'm into magic when I've never practiced magic. Do the chickens have large talons? I just thought the name was multidimensional, represented the esoteric, and the internal mysteries of our godliness. But the accusations continue, so let them be. I couldn't pull a rabbit out of a hat more than America can pull out of Iraq. Now he was crying over spilled magic. And today on April 1st, 2007, don't remind me of what this day means since all days are the same fight and quest for the Gnostics. As the Dalai Lama said, the stars in the heavens don't care about man-made celebrations. The dance continues, but so does the fight. But to some it may be a joke since today we talk of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What is he really? I keep trying to remind myself that when Jesus shuts the door, he opens a window. Yeah, so we have something we can jump out of. I believe that Jesus is a projection of all that is good, or tries to be good, in ourselves. He is part of ourselves we thrive to be or at least admire in celestial tones. Most Christians have barely read the Bible and presuppose that Jesus is kinder than SpongeBob SquarePants. Jesus has been confined to a nice rabbi, the salvation principle of the world, although much of the world doesn't know who he is a revolutionary Che Guevara, a Jewish Confucius, a wayward Essene, and a reincarnation of a cool hippie. In the medieval times he was wrath and the atonement through violence, just to show an example of his evolution. You said it man, nobody fucks with the Jesus. And in these days he's been called the indwelling Christ by New Agers, that force that makes us into demigods. As usual, those malevolent New Agers have missed the mark by degrees. In Gnosticism, our tribulation is both inside and outside of us. We harshly die to our old selves to blossom into our new authentic selves. We do have the indwelling Christ, but we recognize the outer force also emanated from the Pleroma. Every passing minute is another chance to turn it all around. Like the Gospel of Thomas says, the kingdom of the Father is inside and outside of us. It also says the kingdom of the Father is spread all over and men do not see it. If these New Agers and radical Christians think that Christ is simply inside of us, then how come they haven't fixed their lives and cascaded us with their wisdom? Aren't they empowered to live blessed lives forever? 
Of course not, because the ego transformed their projection of the Christ. Perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone would be happy. You can't trust the inner unless you ask for help from beyond. Yes, you gotta depend on yourself and you have to access the supernal spheres afar from reality. As above, so below. The map of the Pleroma, the kingdom of the one true father, is both inside and outside of us. We are gods in the becoming, but as the Gospel of Philip says, we must undergo the mysteries. And eventually Christ will not be an inner spiritual vitamin or a projection, but we shall truly become Christ himself. We will be resurrected before we die. Thanks. I was running short on platitudes. You can leave now. And today to help us are my astral guests, the often controversial Tom Harper, author of The Pagan Christ and Water into Wine, and my friend and brother Nathaniel Merritt, author of Jehovah Unmasked and I Was a Teenage Jehovah Witness. Both will reinforce how allegory, myth, and symbolism are the true keys to enlightenment, instead of some guy hung on a cross that if it was the greatest cosmic event, didn't exactly change the world the last 2,000 years? And spare me free will. A tsunami of that power should have changed the hearts of humanity without a cinch. I've always loved uh, that quote by Voltaire that says that the, the true God surely cannot have been born of a girl, nor died on a gibbet, nor be eaten in a piece of dough. Prepare to receive the true Lord! We also tackle the Tomb of Jesus flapdoodle and throw in the Shroud of Turin as a bonus. Oh, and again Nate shows how Krishna and Buddha are in the same non-historical boat as Jesus. Remember, as my beloved Joseph Campbell said, myth makes you transcendental to the divine. Myth is religion misunderstood. A sign points from the transcendental to the material, and the orthodox keep looking for answers there. Nothing is worse than having an itch you can never scratch. While a symbol points from the material to the transcendental. Follow those symbols in your dreams, in synchronicity, in your rituals, in the stories you hear, in the intuitions you know you should not shunt aside, and you'll begin to enter a territory of pure wonder. It smells like... Victory. Someday this war is going to end. But as always, I warn you, it's not an easy task. As for me, when I found out there was no historical Jesus, it was like a weight was lifted from my chest. I was actually reading the Christ Conspiracy on a snowy Chicago January. Suddenly, I was free from guilt, from my fears as a child of hell, of always looking over my shoulder for that God frowning at me. I was free of so much. And knowing that the Logos is a regenerating principle of the cosmos in the form of Osiris, Dionysus, Mithras, Tammuz, and other dying and rising gods awoke a realization of the archetypes, the seeking of an interior oneness in our consciousness, and the renewal of hope. You are not your job. You're not how much money you have in the bank. You're not the car you drive. You're not the contents of your wallet. You're not your fucking khakis. You were the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. Again, Joseph Campbell said that we need a new myth. That is why groundbreaking movies like The Matrix, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, and now 300 have the protagonists as heroes in a world without God, in which they are redeemed through their actions, as well as by asking help from the supernal which will send magic to them. And I don't mean the magic I'm accused of. I mean the magic of when the spirit and the pleroma grace, when we find ourselves in our own stories, our dark odyssey, through the forests of cursed trees that wish to make us into petrified wood like the rest of the world. I think he's right. There's something about this that, that, that's so black. It's like, how much more black could this be? And the answer is, none. But enough of my drivel. It's two for one today, and I think that Tom and uh, Nate uh, will certainly see and teach you what I'm talking about.
Tom, you uh, obviously had a uh, large body of work before you began uh, The Pagan Christ. What exactly led you to write uh, such a controversial book? Well, when you look back and read the um, the previous books, uh, it's almost uncanny because you can feel it leading towards some of the major theses in the pagan Christ. I was definitely moving towards that direction. And uh, when the research material was first drawn to my attention of Gerald Massey and uh, Kuhn, and then I tied that in with what Joseph Campbell had been saying, of course, in his many works on mythology, and my knowledge of uh, Carl Jung's work on man and his symbols and, and all of that sort of thing, it all came together um, uh, like a great aha, if you want. And how did you feel? Because I remember talking to Timothy Freak, and when he hit that moment when he said, oh my God, Jesus never existed, he thought he was going to hit by a lightning bolt. How exactly did you feel? Well, I felt an enormous shock. I mean, it, it, it literally glued me to my chair for days as I read and, and as I pondered and thought about it. And uh, it, you know, I mean, for 2,000 years, the, the Western world, and Western civilization has simply assumed that, like a meme, sort of a, philosophically you'd call it a meme, right. something you know, that's not challenged. Or, and so um, it, it brought me up short. And uh, as I say in the pagan Christ, and I'm quite honest there, uh, I don't imagine this is going to be easy for any reader who has never uh, gone in that direction before. But I... I had, you know, spent all my life in the church from a choir boy all through seminary, teaching seminary, etc., running a parish. So it was pretty deeply ingrained. Yeah, and unlike uh, other writers uh, who, so, who a lot of them, after they leave Christianity and so forth and have kind of a, a beef, your purpose is not to uh, destroy Christianity, but uh, actually reform it, right? Yes, I, uh, I have a passion, which I have had all my um, adult life, to communicate good news to the world. And I, I believe that the fresh understanding that I now have of the gospel, of the meaning of the Jesus story, and all of that, um, is good news at a profounder level than anything the churches keep talking about. And so um, the the move... The, the movement I want to be part of is not a renewal of the church because I think we're past that stage. It cannot. The time of renewing the church is past, and and because all it really means is rearranging the the furniture, as far as I can see. Uh, it's time for a rebirth, something very radical, and I, w I would like to be part of that movement. So you obviously don't agree with Bishop Sponge. You think uh, it has to be even more radical. Yes, I th uh, he and John Spong is a very, uh, very brave and, and a bright man too, and uh, he and I share much in common, but we we differ quite sharply on the on the radical nature, I think, of the of, of what has to happen. And unlike other scholars who seem to be, uh, they make. Uh, Jesus into an amalgamation of several rising, dying gods. You know, they'll draw from uh, Addis and Mithras and all that. You seem to focus on Horus. Why is this? Well, I go back to Horus because uh, uh, all the ancient thinkers agree that, that Egypt was the temple of the ancient world. Egypt was the source. I mean, I don't care whether you're looking at at Gnosticism, or whether you look at um, Platonism, uh, uh, before that with Pythagoras, if you're looking at at, the, at the, what, what was happening in the ancient world, the the light was streaming forth from Egypt, and uh, in my opinion, the uh, Jesus story as we now have it is the Horus myth in a Jewish setting or in Jewish clothes. It was, after all, for many thousands of years, the, the most powerful myth in the ancient world. And uh, there were, um, uh, I mean, Roman soldiers carried images of ISIS on, as far as Britain and uh, the uh, 
temples of Isis, uh, temples uh, 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 to the worship of Isis and Osiris and, uh, Osiris and uh, Horus uh, were all over the ancient world, including in what is now uh, the so-called Holy Land. I mean, uh, about three miles from Nazareth uh, was the ancient Greco-Roman city of Sepphoris, and there there was daily worship in the time of um, of the first century uh, of the Osiris cult. So it was everywhere. Yes, I've read that even the Jews used to participate in the mysteries of Osiris in Alexandria way yes, back then. Yes, and you then. know how many Jews there were. There were all, yeah, all of the Jews in Alexandria exposed to that. But don't you think that uh, maybe a better prototype would have been Osiris because of his passion and rising? Or why is Horus more important? Well, Ho Osiris Horus blend together so much in the mythology. It's very, everything that Osiris was, Horus is, and more. And um, the sayings that are attributed to Horus um, in the Ritual of the Dead, the Book of the Dead, um, so closely parallel those of of the Jesus in the Gospels, especially uh, the the Christ of the four, four, fourth Gospel, uh, John, that uh, Horus, and because he was the son of God, um, seems to me in many ways a closer parallel. But there are certainly parallels because, as I say, everything Horus did, Osiris did also. Why do you think Judaism created uh, the Jesus in more or less a mystery cult right? Or uh, do you think it uh, sprung out from the sect of Christians? And uh, what was the reasoning for uh, going with for Horus instead of going for other gods like Joshua? Or... Well, you see, they actually were going for Joshua, but Joshua, in my opinion, was already influenced by um, Egyptian thought. I don't think you can make a great divide between um, what Christians call the Old Testament and the New Testament insofar as most of the uh, material in the Old Testament can be sourced in uh, either Sumerian or more likely in Egyptian, uh, in Egyptian roots. So uh, uh, I agree. I think that at the time of the birth of Christianity, uh, which was a much more gradual thing than than most people uh, than traditionally has been believed that the, among the Jewish people there was an expectation that Joshua whose name means God saves would return and so it was very natural I think for uh, Yeshua uh, the anointed meaning uh, Christos in Greek to become Jesus Christ uh, I think it was a natural uh, progression. And how do the Gnostics play into all of this? Well, the Gnostics, um, it's increasingly being realized, um, I think, that you know many people source Gnosticism in many ways. Uh, and there are many tributaries probably running into it. But, but the real ocean behind Gnosticism is um, the hidden esoteric thought that came from Egypt. And so um, Gnosticism, the, I think the very first Christians were Gnostics. And uh, certainly uh, I believe St. Paul was a Gnostic. And uh, we know there was a long battle in the early church uh, as things went on and a dominant party started to emerge, with, with, which later became orthodoxy that tensions arose between those who thought like the Gnostics and those who wanted to be much more literalistic. But that whole allegorizing and, and, and a tendency came from Gnosticism. And I guess it was taken up by a few of the church fathers like Clement of Alexandria and Origen, who then, yeah, were, so later, then were later demonized by the church. Well, that's right. Later they get, um, they, they get the axe for it. But Yes, I think they were, and, and the pivotal figure in all of this is Philo, the 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 the, the, the Alexandrian intellectual who towered above some above others in his in his era, living there contemporaneously with the rise of Christianity, and Philo, as you know, was um, above all 
a Neoplatonist uh, uh, and an allegorizer. And in in fact, uh, there was a whole community of therapeutae, uh, which the word means healers, as you know, uh, living uh, not far from Alexandria, who were Jewish, a big community of Jew- uh, of quasi Essene, quasi Gnostic um, people, who had, according to some of the early records, some of the same material that later shows up in the epistles and in the Gospels um, of the canonical scriptures. So th- there were these um, Gnostic Christians, or uh, sort of proto Christians. Uh, already living um, in and around Alexandria. Yeah, and even the concept of the logos and so forth, that comes right out of Philo. Right out of Philo, yes. If you read Philo on the logos and and, uh, and, and on on and what he has to say about the Son of God, the whole thinking of the emanational, emanational theology, that's pure Egyptianism uh, translated uh, into Greek and then Jewish form. And you think this is original Greek thought, or maybe it's hermetical, or did the hermetical thought come afterwards? Yeah, the hermetical thought is sort of the uh, codification or the uh, putting down um, in a solid way what had been streaming forth um, in the book of Toth and so on from Egypt. And uh, why was uh, Christianity so successful? I believe you say it simply was it the first time that they actually made their dying and rising God man someone who had actually existed or who had come in the flesh? Yes, I think that the appeal was that, and it's the appeal in in North America today. If you, if you see the preaching that goes on, on on television, we know how dumbed down it is, how, how, <laughs> how, how awful, I mean, intellectually awful it is. And um, this is because today, as in the early centuries, the lowest common denominator finds it much easier to think concretely, literally, and not to handle, be able to handle abstraction or anything that calls for um, um, uh, the imagination. Yeah, and certainly, uh, like you mentioned, Joseph Campbell and mythology and Carl Jung's archetypes. Yes, you really think helped. with big, big intellects like that and with the kind of exposure they've had, especially Joseph Campbell, that, um, that, that people would think twice before insisting on a literal rendering of scriptures, you know, but but unfortunately, it, it, they, their message doesn't seem to have got across. Uh, that's the kind of message I think has to be hammered home. Uh, that's why I've done my book, Water into Wine, as a follow-up to the pagan Christ, because in it, I look at the four Gospels and say, okay, if, if the pagan Christ is right, and the way to understand all ancient scriptures is allegorically then what do the Gospels look like from that point of view? And that's what I've tried to set set forth, and I call it, and the subtitle is, An Empowering Vision of the Gospels, because I think it is empowering when you see these old, old stories to which we have become so long accustomed suddenly burst forth in an allegorical form, and you realize what they're really talking about. It's empowering. And what exactly is the message, that the Christ is indwelling in us, or that the Logos is indwelling in us? Yes, you can put it a number of different ways, but that it, it, you can boil the message down to this, that the Christ did not come as a man, the Christ came in man, or in humanity, so that the Christ mind, the Christ principle, the Christ image, however one wants to phrase it, and if you were a Hindu, you would be talking about the Atman and so on, the inner core of us is divine. There is divinity within us. And the mystery of the ancient mysteries and the mystery that St. Paul talks about and the mystery that the Gospel of Mark says Jesus talked about, if there was a historical Jesus, Anyway, the mystery at the heart of the gospel is this, that, <clears throat> that we are spirits 
incarnate. We are the Word made flesh, each one of us. And I think that is fantastic good news. And where do you think the church got their idea of uh, the atoning blood of Jesus saving humanity? I don't know. Dear knows. I mean, if there is <laughs> if there is any doctrine that that makes little sense to me now, um, it is the idea that um, somehow the the death on an instrument of torture. If it were possible that God had sons in a literal sense, uh, and if it were possible for God to die, I mean, all of these blow your mind philosophically because it, the Gnostics were right. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't even make sense. But supposing that we're true, how can one man's death, however holy, atone for Auschwitz and for the Crusades and for what's going on in Iraq and 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 the sin that happens moment by moment, it it just, I mean, it it's, it's just incomprehensible. Yeah, but uh, they, uh, like Nietzsche says, the last person, the last thing a person of faith wants to hear is the truth. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, you're right. I think Joseph Campbell said, or it may have been Jung, no, it was Jung, he said, you know, when you have all the props and so on of a structured faith going for you, it's enormously threatening to have any, even a tiny thread of that fabric pulled a little bit, and uh, and, and panic sets in because um, it's just uh, people just don't want to go there. But but it's the same with truth in any department of life. It it is threatening. And do you do you see this uh, struggle of you know the mythicist case or the Gnostic case? Do you see it growing uh, because of maybe the success of the Da Vinci Codes and the Gospel of Judas, or do you see us uh, still having an uphill battle? Well, certainly it would be an uphill battle. It will certainly not come down from above in the sense that uh, one cannot look to religious leaders um, to initiate this change. Um, as As always, it will have to come up from below, from from ordinary people who catch catch the vision. Um, I don't think the world was ever changed by a great majority. So um, it's, uh, it's going to be the yeast. It's going to be the salt. It's going to be the the light. But yes, it'll, it'll have a, a struggle. And uh, can you tell us some more about uh, your insights or? Uh what exactly you wanted to do with your new book that's coming out, Water into Wine? Well, as you know, the water into wine comes, it's a metaphor. It comes from the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, and is the first of seven great signs or miracles that um, the Jesus figure is supposed to have, um, have done. Now, if you take this as a literal story, then he made... Uh, hundreds of gallons, because that's the quantity we're talking about, hundreds and hundreds of gallons of wine instantly by a snap of his fingers, like some sort of magician or whatever, and uh, um, proceed, the people proceeded to, to get drunk on it and so on. <laughs> if, 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 you, if you realize that this isn't about literally that, it's about the force of the Christ within you that can take the ordinary water, the material, which is a kind of a symbol esoterically for matter anyway, can take water and transform it into something intoxicating or something that has ferment and lifting power, uh, like the difference between flat water and, and a top-notch wine, then, then you have a powerful metaphor for the spiritual life. And what's a metaphor? A metaphor, a metaphor is, as the two Greek root words suggest, something that carries you beyond the obvious connota- uh, denotation of the of, of the text to an inner reality. That, so, calling the book "Water to Wine" is the signal that I'm trying to show that there's much more 
to the Gospels than, than many people have imagined. When you read them as the early Christian's origin and his teacher Clement and the Gnostics as did, you you see the symbolism and the uh, you get away from all the ma- this somebody walking around like a magician um, and uh, professedly human but obviously not human having four aces up his sleeve um, <laughs> as you know um, you get away from all of that and you're talking about spirituality instead of something literal. And you focus not only on the fourth gospel, but you also what you focus on what else? The synoptics, anything in the Old Testament? No, mainly uh, only touch on the Old Testament insofar as it is manipulated by the people who wrote the, the four gospels to serve their purposes. I mean, most of the Old Testament prophecies that make a kind of framework for the for the gospel story. Um, uh, are somewhat wrenched from their original meaning and, and, and used. So I comment on that. But no, basically I'm talking about, okay, if this, uh, if you can't, if you look at the Gospels critically, as the Jesus Seminar has done and as, as in fact scholars have done for the last almost two, about 200 years, they fall apart when you insist on a historical approach. And that's what's happened today. Scholarly speaking, the, the total liberal is left with no gospel to preach. I mean, the, I heard a Jesus seminar person speaking recently, and, and he said, well, Jesus was a um, social activist who came to a sticky end, and um, he he's dead. He's really very dead. Well, that's... I'm sorry, but that's not good news, you know. And, <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> and and if, if there's something for us spiritually behind the world's great religions, and by the way, I think at heart, at the core, they all say very much the same thing. It is that 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 there is a spiritual dimension of life which just makes the whole thing glow. That at the center of reality. There is a glory, and we're part of that glory, and that glory is within you and within me, and the world is still waiting to see it. Well, I agree wholeheartedly with you, obviously, as a Gnostic and a mythicist. Yeah. Um, lastly, um, you believe, I was reading uh, some of your website, you believe that everything is part of the divine mind, and uh, I've certainly used that term before. What would be your advice to people to break away from its illusion into that state of non-distinction where all is one and one is all? Well, I begin my own prayers daily with a statement along the lines like this, Oh God, I come to you now humbly, not as I conceive you to be, but as you really are in yourself. And in other words, to to try and shake off all the idols, shake off all the constructions, all the memories, all the the bad takes <laughs> on God, and allow God to be a God beyond God, beyond what we have meant by God before, because the depths of God are so infinitely greater than than anything we can conceive of, as you know. And so you, you have to think along those lines. Otherwise, you get caught back up into the uh, dualism uh, uh, and lose the oneness of the great all. And so you do this by uh, daily affirmations. Yes, I, uh, I try. One simply can't um, denude himself or herself of everything that has accreted over the over the uh, the the span of your life uh, by an act of will. And so I, I lay it out simply. Uh, but you know, as Paul says, we don't know how to pray as we ought to pray. By the way, he shows no knowledge of the Lord's Prayer whatsoever at all. He says we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit within us prays, and God, the Father, if you can live with that metaphor, God uh, knows what the Spirit wants and what it's praying. So 
If you pray along those lines, in other words, get try to get freed up from 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 the cliches and uh, the creeds. I believe God hears that prayer. Uh -huh. And that will, uh, in turn, act as will be an act of transformation, inner transformation. Yes, exactly. Water into wine is about transformation. And our religion today, uh, posing as Christianity, is not uh, really a transforming religion. I mean, you may get people like George Bush saying, well, it got me off booze or it got me off something. Well... Praise the Lord. I mean, that's great. Okay, but 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 what's it doing about his thinking about war? What's it doing about his thinking about the torture of prisoners? What's it? You know, so the transforming aspect of of Christianity is uh, needs to be rediscovered. So that, as St. Paul said, and he's a Gnostic, we we go from glory into glory. That's a changing process until one day face to face. Well said. And you don't have a problem with uh, other forms of Gnostics or uh, mythicists or uh, seekers of enlightenment taking other paths, whether that be, you know, uh, meditation and theogens and other forms. No, I, I think there are many, many, many ways. Uh, I, I do have some problems with some of what comes under the Gnostic umbrella in terms of, I mean, just as St. Paul did. I said he was a Gnostic, but you find St. Paul fighting on the one hand against Gnostics who um, saw matter as evil. I do not see matter as evil, and that's a kind of a dualism that came in there on the one hand, and Gnostics on the other who said that because Spirit is what counts, and matter is uh, uh, secondary. Therefore, it doesn't really matter what you do, uh, and what, what you call antinomianism. Uh, Paul fights on those two fronts, and I would um, warn against both tendencies um, under the Gnostic umbrella. But there are dangers with all uh, anything that has any potential for good. Yeah, like Paul says, uh, what the letter killeth and the spirit gives the life. Spirit gives life. Yeah, it should be written on the on the front door of every church in the land. <laughs> oh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I just like to finish up on a, on an optimistic note. I mean, sure. there are um, many, and and a lot of them are in the uh, in the Christian camp today who who look forward with. Uh, um, joy on the one hand, or uh, you might even call it a kind of fiendish glee to what they see as a second coming or the end of the world or Armageddon. And I think that's a lot of nonsense. That the only um, coming of the Messiah there can ever be is in our hearts, the way we've been we've been talking. So I'm optimistic looking ahead. I believe that something is happening. I believe a groundswell is building and that the Spirit is capable of uh, working the rebirth about which I spoke. So I remain optimistic in spite of global warming and everything else. <laughs> yeah, like St. Paul also said, these are the birth pangs of the universe, and he did speak of uh, he did speak of other ages that would come. No, that's right. It's going to happen on this wonderful earth or, or nowhere. Well, uh, again, thank you very much for appearing yeah. on Coffee, Cigar, Notes, and... Uh, Taking to talk your time. To you. Spread and... the word. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. exactly what I'm trying to do. Yeah, good for you. Well, take care and, uh, you, you know, let me see uh, what kind of response you get or drop me a line sometime anyway. Okay, I will do. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, Miguel. Thank Have you. Have a good day. You too. Bye. Bye. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers. Tom Harper, author of The Pagan Christ and Water into Wine, not only giving us a dose of the reality of the esoteric, but also why the core of any religion must be transformative. If you're just going through the motions and getting an adrenaline jolt because Jesus is in your heart and the hymns are nice, you're spitting against the winds of destiny. How shall we fuck off, O oh Lord? Now, without further drivel, while our spiritual pores are open, let's see what Nathaniel Merritt, author of Jehovah Unmasked and I Was a Teenage Jehovah Witness, 
adds to the theme of godly evolution. And he'll give us his three cents on the tomb of Jesus and the Shroud of Turin. Make sure you got more fuel in your cup and relight some planned substance because we continue to shake and burn. You know, smoking isn't just bad for you, it's bad for all of us. Secondhand smoke kills. I'm counting on it. Uh, okay, Nate, uh, thanks a lot for uh, coming to Coffee, Cigarettes, and Osis. You've got the thanks trifecta, and I think you only you and Eteria S have that, although Phil Gardner is coming soon. But uh, since the topic is uh, has to do with the, the pagan Christ, uh, let me ask you what I asked Tom. What was the first time you realized, and I mean realized, that there was no historical Jesus, but that he was a myth. And how exactly did you feel? Did you feel you were going to get hit by thunder? <laughs> All through my Christian life, I'd read materials by anti-Christians and atheists. So I knew that the historical Jesus rested on really shaky ground. In fact, there were times when I was a, a, even a fundamentalist Christian when I didn't believe Jesus was real at all. But then I would argue myself back into faith They'd be like, but Nathan, there are millions of believers in Krishna. Is Krishna real? No, he's not. And, so, <laughs> and I'd start really doubting that Jesus is real. Through one way or another, I'd wind up arguing myself into, into believing it again. But the final realization you're talking about, the final break came uh, literally overnight. It was about 18 years ago. I woke up and I said out loud to myself, I don't believe any of this nonsense anymore, only I didn't use the word nonsense. In truth, I felt really relieved. I felt really relieved. Uh, so somebody rolled a, a huge boulder off my shoulders. I called my best bud, Mark Smith, on the phone, and I said, I got the Jesus monkey off my back. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he, was, he was a fundamentalist, so he was really upset. He's an atheist now, but back then he was a fundamentalist. And, he was really shocked and angry with me, but I was obviously ecstatic. I went out into the living room. I, I put on some relaxing CD music, and a few minutes later, I, I burst into tears of joy, and I kept repeating to myself, there is no God. There's no God. Uh, my wife thought I was losing my mind. I felt, I felt like I'd been born again. again. I, felt, I felt as light as a feather. Um, the world became brand new. I became brand new. I very quickly, after that, embraced Buddhism because it's godless, but it's rational and spiritual. And I was a very happy camper. It, yeah. it didn't have any kind of negative effect on me. I felt released when I realized Jesus isn't real. Yeah, I think uh, I was the same way. I think I finished uh, Cherry S as the Christ conspiracy, and I felt like you know, uh, 30 something years of uh, a demon inside of me being exercised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just all that inner, yeah, it was just gone. I yeah, mean, hell I, and atonement <laughs> and sin and all that other good stuff. Yeah, I, I always had a problem with that. How, why is this cosmos my fault? <laughs> you know, I was just <laughs> born here. What did I do, you know? <laughs> If I could change it, I would. <laughs> yeah, your ancestor ate an apple or something stupid. And um, you always speak what I like in your uh, articles. You speak uh, a lot about mythology, one mythology with a small N and one mythology with a big M. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, I'm wanting people to ask that question of themselves. What's this guy mean by this? And to look for the clues in my articles as to why I do that. I want them to see that the myths I write about aren't just simply urban myths and urban legends like the Jersey Devil or the Loch Ness Monster or fairy tales like the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy, uh, to which God gets compared quite often, uh, or tall tales without any mystical application or, or meaning like, like Paul Bunyan, or even uh, myths like they dispel on that TV show, Mythbusters, which is my favorite TV show, by the way. Um, I'm trying to communicate that I'm talking about the sorts of myths that Joseph K. 
Campbell discussed, myths that actually encode spiritual and mystical teachings. Uh, and they're actually about a journey of inner transformation, such as the Jesus Christ myth or the, the Buddha myth. And I want people to realize that these myths are very important to uh, your spiritual awakening, your inner transformation. So I try to make the distinction by, by capitalizing. And hopefully, my readers think about that and, and, and it alerts them to what I'm doing and, and, and why I'm doing it. Perhaps it doesn't. <laughs> I hope it does. Uh, it'll reach some people. And uh, what, um, backing up, uh, as a Buddhist, uh, do Buddhists have no problem seeing Buddha as a myth, or do they still cling on to the to what Christians do? Well, that would depend on the school of Buddhism. I be, I became a, a, a Zen Buddhist of the Soto variety, and so I wasn't attached to an actual historical Buddha and. None of the, the Buddhists I knew were, except for the, some Theravadins. Um, that, that's the earliest form of Buddhism. They're very attached to there being an actual historical Buddha. Um, but right from the start, I suspected that he was no more historical than Jesus. So I set out to research the Buddha, and, and could, I concluded that he's an amalgamation of several teachers that lived in the same general time frame and in the general area. I can't recall their names after all these years, but I submitted the article to a small publication that's operated by the sect I was associated with, and it went over well, for the mm. most part. But it did anger some people, of course, who, you know, without a Buddha, there's no Buddhism. And, well, no, it's about your Buddha nature. There doesn't need to be a Buddha. Yeah, just like your Christ nature. And why do you think it's so hard for people to let go of the historical Jesus meme? I'm sure there's so many rational priests and, uh, you know, Jesuit intellectuals and so forth that must have the same suspicions we had. Why do you think it's so hard? Is it just, is it just like sanity numbers? Just the way you put it, it's a meme. It's a virus. It really is just like a virus. It's just as tenacious as a as a biological virus. Uh, it's um, it's incurable for most people. You know, some are born with an immunity, and and that's great. They're, they're born with an immunity to, to religious literalism, and some develop an immunity, but very few get a serious mental virus like this, and then and then recover, and develop an immunity. And viruses of any variety, even in your mind, they're, they're almost indestructible. Plus, you know, most people are helix. They don't have an inner life. They don't have an inner dimension. Other than their monkey mind, they don't have an inner dimension to turn to. So when, when you tell them that Jesus Christ is a mythical story about their own true inner nature, it makes no sense. Like, what are you talking about, my true inner nature? All they are is, their, is the swirl of their monkey mind and their emotions. So... If Jesus didn't walk the stage of history, then what good is he to these people? He's just a fairy tale, like the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy. Since they're devoid of any uh, inner mystical dimension, they're unable to cope with life without a literal cosmic parent or, uh, looking down over them. That's not liberating. To, uh, to, to them, it's not liberating to find out that Jesus isn't real. It's terrifying. Yeah, and it's always <laughs> interesting that... Uh... They need something material to prove the spiritual, you know? They need the miracles and stuff. And if they didn't happen, then there is no spiritual world. Well, it scares the, scares the bejesus out of them, at least the ones that I know. Well, not literally. <laughs> <laughs> no, not literally. But it, but it does frighten them. It makes life seem pointless. Rather than you and I, we go, wow, I get to explore my inner self and find the truth for myself, I get to discover reality. Instead of having it handed to me like a sandwich at a delicatessen, you know, here, eat this. That would be basically my answer. It really is a meme. It really is a mental virus, and it's every bit as indestructible as a real virus. It's rare for someone who's been raised in that stuff to, to, be, to be free of it. I'm lucky. I wasn't raised in it. And do you usually uh, wait till, uh, like when you try to talk to people, you wait till they come to you first and then you kind of feel them out or you just, yeah. Uh, yeah, if you I, know they're not going to be convinced, you just don't waste your time? 
I will waste quite a bit of time with them, actually, and then, I, and then I'll, and if it doesn't bear fruit, then I do finally give up. But yeah, I spend a lot of time with people. Uh, and no, I don't seek people out, but uh, they do email me because of my books and because of your website, my articles on your website. I do get email and I spend time with people trying to help. Uh, and I'm now and then successful, but I'm, I'm successful with people who weren't raised in it who became converts to all this uh, literalism, just like I did. Mark mm -hmm. Smith is my only success story with somebody who was actually raised in it. And I was able to deprogram him. To hear him tell it, he deprogrammed himself. It took me about a year <laughs> on hard effort. But, uh, yeah, but then he became an atheist. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> One extreme yeah. to the other. Oh, well, Elise is free. Moving along, uh, can you uh, your excellent article that you put uh, put up on the uh, website? Can you tell us about the tomb of Jesus and why it isn't the tomb of our Lord and Savior? Oh yeah, the, the lost tomb of Superman. I, I mean, the lost tomb of Jesus. Get those two guys mixed up, you know. <laughs> well, you know, as far as I or anyone can tell, you know including you, if there, there is an actual tomb. It was discovered in 1980 originally, then uh, covered back over, and it did contain stone ossuaries bearing the names of Jesus, son of Joseph, Judas, son of Jesus, um, an ossuary bearing the peculiar spelling of Mary that you find in the New Testament, uh, which is Maria, not the, the normal spelling you'd expect, Miriam. Also, there's a... a a, a Joseph ossuary, which is... Wait, holding name. right there. So Maria is an older word than Miriam? Yeah, Miriam is, is Jewish, completely Jewish. Maria is, is a synthesis of Greek and um, Greek and Latin or Greek and Hebrew. I forgot. It's escaping my brain right now. But no, it's not normal. Okay. It's not a normal spelling at all. And it's the, the spelling we find in the New Testament, which... Um, of course, there's the, the Judas ossuary and the Matthew ossuary and the Mariamne Emara, the Mary also called the Master ossuary, which that is applied to Mary Magdalene in the Gospel of Philip and by the Eastern Orthodox churches. So the statistical likelihood that this is anyone other than the Jesus of the Gospels is astronomically small. It's, uh, but it's so very neat and tidy and convenient. The, the only problem with this is that there's no evidence that an actual Jesus Christ ever existed, no more than Superman. This is like finding the tomb of Superman with Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen, Perry White, and Lex <laughs> Luthor all buried with him. It's just nuts. Everybody should be going, what is going on here? Superman isn't real, and Jesus Christ isn't real. So this find is not only a fake tomb, it's a highly suspect fake there's an agenda here. There's an agenda here in faking this tomb. And it, it's not just some prank. you got to ask yourself, who stands to profit by this tomb? Who, or who stood to profit by making this tomb? And I'm not sure. Perhaps it was one of the early Judaist forms of Christianity that wanted to quell talk of Jesus never having, uh, having had a physical body. to say, well, yes, he did. Here, we have his bones. Or maybe they wanted to quell... Uh, talk of uh, the a bodily resurrection by showing his tomb and bones. Or, or it could, really have been, uh, could have been Constantine's mother, Elena, who went around making up stuff, and then she decided, well, this is not that good. Let's just yeah, leave she, it there. Yeah, that's a good idea. I hadn't even thought of that. What, she tortured somebody to find out the location of the true cross. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, she celebrated in the Eastern Orthodox Church, but when I started looking at her, it's like, man, <laughs> this is not a saint. No, not, not at my all. definition anyway. So yeah, there's there was no Jesus. There's no evidence that he ever existed. Period. But there's a mountain of evidence that he didn't. He's as unreal as Superman. So the lost tomb of of Jesus should strike everybody as the same as the lost tomb of Superman would. What? the heck is going on here so follow the money trail 
yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think uh, people are just hungry for anything new that has to do with alternative Christianity. Oh, yeah. So I think they'll take anything. They're just tired of the old. It's out of hand. And, uh, and uh, continuing on uh, famous artifacts, you also talk about the infamous Shroud of Turin in your article. How did uh, this hoax come to life? Oh, man. I hate to admit it, but <laughs> when I was a Christian, I was really taken in by the Shroud of Turin. <laughs> I, I, was, I really was. I was like 20 when I first became acquainted with it. I, I just became completely fascinated with it. I thought, here's an actual empirical piece of evidence that can be examined that this has to be Jesus Christ. It meets all the criteria. The, the uh, shroud first showed up um, back in 1355 by a, a French knight by the name of Geoffrey de Charnay. He was in debt, came back from the Holy Land, and lo and behold, here he has the shroud that Jesus was wrapped in. He, uh, he built a church in Leary, Lyrey, L-I-R-E-Y, France, and started charging the faithful to come in and gawk at the shroud and worship it. Uh, he died a, a year later, and there was a lot of intrigue about the shroud, and which is really not, not relevant. But it was put on display. The, the faithful came and worshipped it for hundreds of years. And then in 1898... Uh, an Italian photographer named Secondo Pia, he was the first to photograph it. And he was the first to see for the first time that the image on the shroud is actually a negative image. So when you take a photograph, the, the negative in your camera is actually a positive. And when he looked at that image, he saw all that detail. Detail that it's not, if you look at the shroud itself, there's, it's, it's just like a smudge almost. There's hardly any detail. But this picture he took, suddenly there's all this detail in a man's face, eyes, mustache, uh, beard, flowing, coagulating blood. It uh, was made for, obviously there was a real uh, corpse used in the making of it, but again, follow the money trail. Uh, right, it then, could be anybody. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm, well, from what I've read about it, I'm really convinced that it was made by... Um, Muslims, Arab, Arab Muslims, because they had the kind of knowledge of optics and chemistry to be able to pull this off at that point in time. I mean, the image is not made by any brush strokes. It's directionless. It's, it's composed of dehydrated fibers on the uppermost layers of, of the image of each size, each side. The image is 3D. In other words, a 3D image can be made from it using an image analyzer. Uh, it fluoresces under ultraviolet light. It's very strange. And it wasn't until ooh, sometime in the 90s that uh, Dr. Nicholas Allen, he was the first to reproduce the shroud image in every aspect using uh, a camera obscura, um, a shroud that had been made photosensitive using um, silver nitrate, and he used urine because it, it contains ammonia to fix the image so it, it, it wouldn't fade. His first try, the image didn't fluoresce under ultraviolet light the way the, uh, the shroud does. So he substituted an optical grade quartz lens like would be used in the uh, medieval times. And lo and behold, his second try, the image fluoresced under ultraviolet light. So he's been able to completely uh, duplicate all the features of the shroud, which no other researcher had up to that point. And to me, this is really relevant to this whole Tomb of Jesus thing. This had people flummoxed for, for, for hundreds of years and for decades since the Kandopia, but investigation, science, were finally able to unravel it, and it was demonstrated to be a fraud in 1988 by Carbon-14, and now Dr. Nicholas Allen has actually demonstrated how it was made. The same thing will happen with the, with the so-called Tomb of Jesus. Enough investigators will get involved. Lo and behold, you'll find out it's a fraud too.